what I'm advocating there is that we're also in a state when these things fail that we still have to know how it works. And that's why cloud engineers still have a job because when these things fail, we know how to fix this stuff. And maybe we have a better helper in that, but we understand what this is. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 250. From Godfather of DevOps to Godfather of AI. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your hosts, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, here we are at episode 250. Not only is it 250, if you're listening today, it's Valentine's Day, February 14th. So, Victor, if I could, I would just reach through the screen and give you a big hug. Luckily for me, we're doing this remotely, so <laughs> I'm safe. <laughs> you are safe. And in case you heard that third laugh come in there, we have, like we do on all of our Divide by 50 episodes, we have Patrick Dubois on with us again. Patrick, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm just going to do the hard for you both, right? 250. Yeah. That's, that's, that's kind of amazing, <laughs> right? It is amazing because I don't think we ever had a plan, but the plan didn't include 250. But yet, here we are. So in case you don't know who Patrick is, a little bit of backstory. He's considered to be the godfather of DevOps. That was 20 years ago now, Patrick? Something like 15, 20. 15, 20. Yeah, 15, like 20 right. Yeah. And of course, we've been saying all along that DevOps isn't a thing anymore. So that means everything that you did in the past, Patrick, means nothing. Who cares anyway, right? <laughs> the past, the past. <laughs> <laughs> But now, he is the godfather of AI. Whoa, no, I'm not there. <laughs> totally not there. Yet. Uncle. Okay, let's Uncle. redo this. Like, I'm totally there. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> let's say it like this. <laughs> and in case you don't listen to the end, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now. You need to at least listen through a little bit of this. Because most people we find listen 25 to 30 minutes, and usually we go about 40 to 45, somewhere in there. I want to tell you now, right now, if you want to have Patrick speak at a conference for your team, for whatever, whether it's on site or whether it's remote, he's open to all those things in 2024. Am I speaking out of turn, Patrick? No. And you know what the reason is? Why I'm so passionate about that stuff. <laughs> It's just, I have a lot of new energy, AI and DevOps. It's just, uh, you know, find my love again. That's how I can say it. So currently, and we're not going beyond this, is currently he's doing management. We're, we're so sad. But let's get into the AI thing. Now, back in September of 2023, you did an online meetup for London DevOps, I believe. Sounds right. Titled, because I have it here in front of me, LLMs and Gen AI explain it to me like I'm a software engineer. I want to rewrite that. Explain it to me like I know nothing other than how to click on Hello World. I want to say one thing too. Here's a question and then you can try to sort of, and we'll go across everything today. Why is the whole thing about, what is it, the Python? I call it a run book. It's not a run book. What, what is that called? Like how you did your demo. Jupiter you did Notebook. Jupiter Notebook. That. Yeah. Jupiter Notebooks. Why? <laughs> I mean, it's cool from a presentation standpoint, but boy, that seems like a horrible way to actually do anything. It's an interesting question. So that format has been there for a while, just in general, you know, kind of data science. And it's actually an interesting mixture between having documentation mixed with code. 
And the other interesting thing is that it almost has this caching layer. Like when you execute one thing, you change it. It's closer to maybe a visual debugging <laughs> than, than it is with your code. I personally use it to share things on how they're done, like the documentation. I use it also for exploratory stuff where I don't know really well and compiling and running things again all the time of the whole program doesn't really make sense. So that kind of gives this, I would guess it's like a hint toward no, it's not towards no code, but it feels like this lightweight version of coding stuff and especially the sharing stuff. I, I'm able to share that with you. You can run this on your GPU just by running the notebook in your browser, nothing special that you need. So there's no code set up of, of installing and, and running things like that. So anyway, it's interesting. And the other thing that it helped me actually during the demo, if I would have to run this, you know, all these AI examples, and I would have to run them live, I'm so scared of doing this. <laughs> like everything will break. I install something new, it's broken. So the nice thing is that it keeps the input which is the code, it keeps the output, and that is a perfect way of showing what you actually already did. Anyway, that's kind of my long summary of that stuff. What I'm going to say is probably comes from not that not being my focus, and I'm probably going to say something silly, but to me, the whole AI sounds like a perfect candidate for no code. Why would we write code for that in the first place? Kind of, you know, and I'm really speaking as an amateur here, but I, I imagine it at least in the future. Kind of, here's my data, figure it out. Well, I, I guess there are two things. Like, why would I have to want to run code to configure my <laughs> infrastructure? <laughs> Shouldn't they be able to figure out what I need? But there's the people who have to build that infrastructure, <laughs> and they might need to write some part of that code to nudge it in the right direction. So part of this is the split between being consumer of that stuff and kind of being able to direct and create and, and use it uh, in certain stuff. The node code part, um, it comes in very interestingly when I talk about DevOps and AI, I usually ask them, which angle do you want to hear? Do you want to hear AI enhancing DevOps? Or do you want to hear DevOps enhancing AI delivery? And the first one of doing more DevOps with AI tools is typically driven by vendors providing those tools. And you don't really know what they do. So that could be the abstraction layer that you're talking about. Just figure out, like, you know, here's, here's all of my stuff. Do and then I'll, I'll just type in a text prompt. But the other side is like, yeah, if I need to deliver that AI service, I, I do have to kind of bring it up and do a lot of stuff to make it actually work behind the scenes. And I think that's not different from cloud uh, in that perspective. Define an AI service. The better rephrasing would be a service that uses AI. So I'll, I'll, I'll give the, the example of very much, you know, the, the trivial one I have a large document and I want to have a summary. I just want to say, give me a summary. <laughs> but behind the scenes, there's pieces that chunk up that text that feed it to the right LLM that kind of check what language it is to get better results that make sure there's no bad results given back to me that it has the right length that I asked for in my UI. So there's a lot of constraining things so it's a service powered by AI and yeah, for building it, I can't just tell the LLM, build yourself. Although that is kind of the goal that we're going for. So I agree with you there, but it is now kind of a stepping up to that more of, I have to deal with this myself to, I have something assist me to have something to auto figure this out. In many cases, we're not there yet on the auto figure this out. And there still needs to be a, a lot of grunt work to make this work. Let's go back to that first point of AI enhancing DevOps. Mm -hmm. Why would anybody want to do that? You wanna have a few cases and where that's useful? Absolutely. Okay, so 
I come in as a product owner and I have to think about certain use cases. And then I ask the LLM, given this situation, what are some of the common things that happen? So the, the AI will generate some of those cases for you and to kind of gets you almost like in a creative way of doing this. Then imagine you have a system that brings in a lot of customer feedback. And I'm not talking like 10 tickets in Jira. I'm talking like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. As a product owner, how do you go through that stuff? So that system on AI can help you reduce those parts. Then I go into the next phase. I would like to have an interface on this. And I can draw this on the back of the napkin. And then the AI converts this maybe into some code. Some UI, you know, the, the, the vertex stuff is, is able to do. I, I, t I just draw a picture of the UI and it converts it to code. Then I have my code and then I want it to maybe generate some of the test cases for me and the test code. And then I have it verify whether it has security bugs with some AI. <laughs> and then I deploy it and I actually, during the deployment, I don't know what to do, so I ask it to write me and help me with writing some Docker files or other stuff and brings it to production. And when I'm in production and things fail, the AI assists me in finding all the information that my colleagues have put in there, all the knowledge bases that I usually am not able to find when I really need them in the middle of the night to do support. It gives me feedback on whenever I take something, is it useful for the SLA, am I not breaching an SLA, has anybody done this before, what are the risks of the changes that I'm doing? So is, is that kind of giving you ideas of where it fits in the whole pipeline? I think so. To me, that sounds like almost like having an extremely fast junior helper in a, in a positive way, right? Kind of somebody who can, who is much faster than anybody else but it's kind of doing junior work, kind of, hey, triage that, this for me, right? That's normally in the past what you would give to an assistant, right? Go through those 10,000 tickets and give me executive summary of what's happening there, right? Although it, it's, it's going to be hard for a junior to understand what is really important in the summary. So I wouldn't say that is just what you ask a junior. <laughs> because it's not just condensing the words, it is trying to reduce the, like, express the meaning. And the same thing if you're on call and you get that support, it's not that it's the junior who doesn't know how to solve an issue. It's the machine who has more than knowledge than you probably read across the whole wiki of your enterprise that can help you with that stuff, <laughs> right? So, um, True. Yeah. And, and of course, there's trivial, tedious work that we used to do that we can hand off to the AI and say, figure it out. Like, you know, you know th that's fine. But it, it's not always that junior thing, I believe. True. But then I guess if we, if we look slightly more in the future, and st I still keep the scope within operations, DevOps, engineering, right? I guess that we should probably see not so far from now some attempts at doing things as well, right? Like, you know, right now I need to define, okay, scale my application, number of replicas of my application, the number of requests reaches this and that stuff like that, right? That sounds like a plausible example of something that AI could do, right? Kind of, I can sit there and actually do the scaling for you. I think that is what traditionally maybe is close to what we have been calling on AI ops, we look at trends, on scaling, we do something with this, and we work on that. I think the difference now is, is that um, AI would start doing uh, things like, I'm going to contact um, Darren, not because you've told me to contact Darren, but because I saw that Darren on Slack gave me the most responses on this, and already solved this in another ticket system and kind of so it, it has broader knowledge than something that is just statistical uh, things and then is able to conduct things like i see a happening i see b there was a release and i kind of without coding this i just feed it the information and it gives me an answer back 
So I, I don't have to express and le have to learn this Kubernetes. The LLM already has the LLM knowledge, uh, the Kubernetes knowledge. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, and that's one of the battles we're going through. Like, okay, I need to solve this. What's this bug? Uh, how do I deal with this? Given the current state of the the, the cluster, and and what's interesting is that you, in the past, we would do a lot more coding to get that same effect, and now we say the words, and somehow magically the Gen AI kind of understands us better in getting that answer. I give the example of, imagine you have to triage something that is red and blue. In the past, we had to train a whole model very much on, is this a blue picture? Is this you know the other color? And you have to feed it a lot of data things. Now we take a vision model and we just ask, okay, you know, is this red? Is this blue? And we, we don't have to program and train this anymore in there. And the same thing, if I want to connect this to my API, we don't have to code all the API calls. We just feed it the documentation of the API. And with the documentation, it's able to figure out what the exact call is that it needs to do. So we're not coding this anymore. So, so we're going in, in what I believe an extra step of making this less friction for us on having to express this. So it becomes, a it becomes less expensive. The problem right now is that we have to constrain it and make sure, and we have to put our energy over there right now. But the systems are evolving and getting better in that way. What you just said with the vision model, I really hadn't thought much about, but it parallels exactly what we do in a day-to-day -day type job. We don't use just one tool to do everything. The way that maps is we don't use just one model to do everything. We need to chain together different models to get the outcome that we want, right? Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's one of the things people first believe, like that one model is going to solve it all. But typically you have one maybe orchestrating model who asks it through APIs to other models and, and who are more specialized in certain things. And you say, you know, if you have that kind of problem, ask that model. If you have that kind of problem, go with this model. And you just write that text. You don't code this. You just say, here's a tool, here's another tool. And, and that is your coding of expressing your set of tools. So imagine you build a whole database of tools. Like this is how you do Kubernetes uh, uh, deployment. This is how you do debugging. This is, and you build that whole list of tools and you describe what the tool does. And then based on the model and the documentation, it actually starts running that stuff. So that's kind of the Walhalla where we're heading for with the agents, with the text. And it's less about the coding. And you see that with people you know, running GPTs on OpenAI or kind of working on that thing that it's it's more about expressing what I'm supposed to have than actually doing all the plumbing work to get it all together uh, in a way. It is a belief, right? But And I'm not saying we're there yet, but we're definitely making strides uh, towards that thing. It almost feel as, feels like the similar to programming, like that some people get better results than others depending on how proficient they are at writing those prompts. I mean, I, I've seen things done in mid-journey, and then when I go to mid-journey and try to do something cool, it's not even close. Right? And I'm using the same engine, I'm using the same AI, and I'm still not getting similar results. Yeah. Inter interestingly enough, I, I spent one of the, uh, the last weeks a lot on image generation. And I can tell you, I had the same thing. Like, I'm not, I don't know what to type in that prompt, and I don't know exact how it works. But what I find out is the prompt and the text is one way of putting it in there. Imagine I want to have somebody do the silly walk, right? Then I take the video of that silly walk, I convert that to with a model to open pose, which is kind of just translates it to the arms and the legs moving and the head and the eyes. And then I take that to influence the stable diffusion or mid journey generation. So I'm using another assistant to do that. 
The same thing is if I have a mid jury, I'm not ger generating the perfect legs or arms or face. I use another face detailer or leg <laughs> corrector to, to bring that in. So we use, you see this in, in many ways that the one thing will not cut it, but if you start all assembling these things together, and the same thing is happening in, let's say in the support agent. So the canonical example is I am on call and we're gonna train seven different models or advisor. One is optimized for cost. One is optimized for SLA. <laughs> one is optimized for making it work. One is optimized for, I don't know, something else. And they give all feedback while you're doing this work. And then maybe we have one, which is the decider model, which is very good at <laughs> taking all the input and deciding that stuff. So that, that's kind of what, what people are now building, because then you can train all the others and you don't have to be the generic all-knowing model uh, anymore. By the way, is this still DevOps or are we off the record right now? <laughs> it's automation. I can tell you it's automation. <laughs> No, that's all DevOps should be is automation. <laughs> I, I want I want to stick back to the the point you were making about training seven models. Th that was just an example that then fed into a decider. Conceptually, that makes sense. But you're taking this word train and just throwing it around like it means nothing. Yeah. I'm hearing it going, how in the bleep would I train a model? I mean, wh what what is the actual mechanics of training a model? I'm first going to take the LLM, right? So LLM would take a big company uh, like OpenAI, Microsoft, uh, an infrastructure as we can never pay or a company, you know, even a big company will never be able to pay. And they build that model. They, they scrape the internet. They put it all. It costs enormous amount of money, right? But then what you see happening is, for example, Facebook released another model, uh, Llama, and you're able to reduce that in size through some optimization that you don't have to have all the neurons in, in the network. And you're all of a sudden, you're able to run this locally on your laptop. I, I can run the LLMs with a good quality. I can run a vision model on my laptop right now, or if I have a beefy machine. Then the next thing is, imagine that is the generic model but then I can feed it with specific examples during my prompt. I can say, here's three examples of something I, I want. Answer me the result. That's prompt engineering, that's prompt optimization. And then if I go a step further, I say, here's a database with all the solutions. <laughs> here's my question, it goes out to searching all the possible answers that are related through some you know, math and AI. And it finds all that information back. And then it says, here's five pieces of data. Answer me the solution, given those five pieces of information. So that's another way of getting this in. And then when that is not enough, because you have a limit on what you can put into a prompt, you, you cannot go like, you know, here's, Here's five billion things I'm going to put in the, in the prompt. Then you, what you can do is, and I call it like, you have that model file, maybe you reduce it in size, and then you can patch it. And you patch this by giving it maybe a hundredth or a, a thousand examples instead of millions examples. And those are like small slices, you, you know, in our world, that would be, you know, you patch the model, it's a small file, and it's very tuned to what you have been training this on. So there are special models who are better even at being fine tuned in the end. But you can say the same thing with an image. Mid journey is very broad. But if I want to tune this on on my face, I give it 500 examples or, or even 50 or 10 <laughs> and it creates that patch on the model and I have something that will reproduce m my face, God forbid, but <laughs> it would be able to do that on a, a regular computer without any problem. Is that something that is happening in public services already or, or you still need to run your own models? Are there services where I can say, hey, 
here are my faces, your example, right? To mid journey or something like that. No. Yeah, there's runway, there's, um, there's every day, there's new services coming out. <laughs> you can't keep track of that stuff. Uh, I, I have never seen, let's say, an, um, a technology revolution being so f fast at saucifying itself. <laughs> like, it's like instantly everybody has that in the service. Uh, so it's, it's insane. Obviously, it's more than bring that service. It's about having a good UI. It's about having adopting of users. It's setting your pricing correct. But there is just definitely an explosion of that stuff happening. Uh, and everybody's scrambling and wants to be the first. Um, and that's another thing you see now. It, we're in a we're on a moment in time where there's the complete sprawl of we don't know which one is going to be the winner. We've had that before, <laughs> you know, which winner is going to win the cloud and all of a sudden one came out like, okay, this is going to be the de facto standard. We're still a long way away from that, or maybe not, like maybe in a year it settles down. But now we have what I call an innovation tax that, let's pick one, <laughs> seems good, seems working, but tomorrow your competitor might be cheaper, better, I don't know, and then I have to swap it out. So we're in this crazy period of chaos a little bit. What does all that mean for us? Like, uh, I'm including you in that group, software developers, engineers. Yeah. What's, what, what's our jobs going to look like if we're having them? I think we're, uh, we're still going to work uh, with tools, but it's just going to be different tools. Given the example of the video is maybe, you know, the, the, uh, in that world, an easy one. I'm, I don't need to go on site to do certain videos. If I have the face, if I have the body, I can direct my own movie in a way. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but anyway, for a software developer, I feel that certain things that we are now laboring through, <laughs> Let's create a view transformation of this Figma file, <laughs> right? Okay, why? <laughs> we need to deploy this into the cloud. Why do we need to learn all that syntax? So there's definitely the possibility of going an abstraction layer higher. And somebody called it as, instead of building the tools, we're going to build the tool that build the tool. And that might be premature optimization, as we've always done, you know, adding another layer of abstraction kills everything, basically. But <laughs> it is something that allows certain things to go faster. But what I'm advocating there is that we're also in a state when these things fail, that we still have to know how it works. And that's why cloud engineers still have a job, because when these things fail, we know how to fix this stuff. And maybe we have a better helper in that, but we understand what this is. I really want to make the plea of that it's not a data science thing anymore. I'm, I'm not a data scientist and, and I can build those kind of apps. I can build that kind of logic because I'm an integrator and I'm used to doing this. And so I'd advocate everybody to learn this as a new skill because what I see happening, for example, in our company, they say, well, you know, that team has to understand coding, of course, you know, that's what they do, application coding. We told them that you need to know a little bit of the cloud. We told them you have to know a little bit of mobile. And now we are saying you need to know a little bit of AI integration and pick the right service and get that integrated in whatever code you're writing instead of writing the code yourself. So. That's kind of where I think it's leading us. Now we're seeing it just the manifestation of, oh, copy and paste from a copilot into your code. But what if we could just say refactor on a code base? That's a different level, which is really hard for us to grasp sometimes. And then we can also say, fetch whatever you need from Figma, from, from whatever tool, uh, talk to that person, come back when you have an answer, we're delegating it some tasks. So maybe we're back to being the lazy one, <laughs> but we already know that's what we learned with kind of, you know, the whole DevOps transformation is that whatever we abstract, <laughs> there's more work <laughs> on the higher layer <laughs> uh, that we can do. So, and maybe more interesting stuff as well. It feels like 
you're describing being a manager, right? Yeah, in a way, a it good is. manager needs to know a bit of everything. He's not necessarily, or she is not necessarily, an expert in this, an expert in that, but just enough to be able to kind of bring all those people together and make things happen, right? What you're explaining feels like that, as, as except that those people are now AIs, but I still need somehow to to have sufficient understanding of everything to bring it all together. Yeah, and in some things you you can still be uh, more detailed, more expert, um, definitely. And uh, there's there's still what I call the hunch of <laughs> where where I need to look from experience, but it might accelerate our learnings as well along the way, uh, in that way. And the, the maybe the difference is that instead of us having to manage humans is that they're maybe patient, <laughs> they're polite, <laughs> they're always responding to us. <laughs> they might not do what we want though, because that that is the the typical internet joke. Um, AI will never replace what we do because everybody's so bad at specifying what they need. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, if I just have text, it's going to be really hard to express what I need. But maybe if it has a good memory and it learns from past things, from what your corporate culture is, what you need, they can compensate some of that stuff. I'm not saying it's, it's going to be perfect, but uh, are you worried now? No, not at all. I mean... I'm not worried that I see it, and this might sound strange, right? I see it in a similar way as I imagine people were seeing the situation at the beginning of industrial revolution. Everybody starts panicking what we are going to do. But at the end of the day, what ends up happening is that we all do a better job. We all do more with less. No, it's, it's, it's true. And I hope that. And, and, and I'm not blind about, you know, the weak spots right now. And I'm not blind about that this might change certain people's job or some jobs will be less relevant and that we have to reinvent on, on, on our stuff. And also that models have maybe toxic content and all that stuff. So I'm not saying that problem is not there and it's definitely something to solve. But my approach is the more that I use it, the more that I understand it, the more that I get productive, but the, also the more that I understand what it can't do and where it needs love to get fixed. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm less uh, of like, okay, we're, we should not be using this. I'm, I'm trying to understand better to do also a better job at understanding the weaknesses of it. Well, I think one of the weaknesses that we always run into going back to training, if I was to point it at any company's wiki that's existed for more than five years, that model is going to be so stinking conf confused because everything's going to be out of date. Is that one of the inherent weaknesses that you see as well? Or is there, what, what are some of the other big ones that, I mean, to me, bad data, oh, garbage in, garbage out, is what you're going to get, right? To me, that, that sounds like, what I'm going to say is probably wishful thinking, uh, correct me. But to me, that sounds like actually the, the other way around. It's perfect opportunity for having a helper, I'm going to continue using that term, sorry, kind of go and validate your docu documentation against the co uh, code that you have uh, currently running and the public information, this and that. Shouldn't they be actually the example precisely that how your what you said, Darin, uh, could be improved? Because humans are not going to go through all the documentation to update it, right? That's not going to happen. But the machine might. Yeah, and it might flag down humans to kind of correct or improve. But... There is definitely one of the weaknesses is there's a time aspect to things. When you use language to express things, certain things get different meanings over time. I once were, worked with a, a company who had like video archive and they had manual tagging of the taxonomy in the keywords. And imagine the taxonomy of saying, it's a big TV <laughs> being one of the words. It, it changes over time, right? <laughs> What is a big TV? <laughs> and kind of that time sensitiveness. But we have timestamps on stuff. We know the editing. So what you see is that we're maybe caring more and more also about the metadata that we're creating and the data and the changes and who did what. Because, you know, maybe that was not a savvy person. Maybe that was a savvy person. And we're kind of 
mitigating some of those items there as well. And maybe we say, well, imagine you have a wiki and say, today, that means A, tomorrow, that means B, rewrite my wiki. <laughs> we would never be able to do that as a human, uh, but maybe a machine can help us in there some, somewhere. So there is the thing that it makes things up, hallucinations. Uh, I think most people have come across that. There's also ways of kind of tackling this. Uh, sometimes you just have to ask the LLM, are you sure? <laughs> and then it, it just says like, no, I'm, I, maybe I, I do something else. You can ask it three times. You know, we learned you just have redundancy. <laughs> it's the same technique. Or you just ask another LLM, what do you think? Are you? <laughs> and then we need a third one to decide. So how does it work? If AI doesn't work, you run more AI on it. It's, it's kind of like... <laughs> a classic one, but it's how much you want to believe and how cheap this is going to get that we are able to do this. And But that was the same thing of running multi-cloud, you know, blew people's mind many years ago. Now it's like, okay, it's still hard. I'm not saying it's easy, but some people are definitely doing that because there's there's benefit versus the cost that we're doing that. And anyway, I'm, I'm, I get excited and I... Again, I don't want to be blind for the things not working. And uh, it, some stuff is definitely experimental, but it is fascinating. So, My problem is that I have the mixed feelings at it, for it right now, at this moment, that will change in the future, is that I'm very excited. This is amazing, and I'm using uh, it in many cases. But on the other hand, frustrated, because it's. I feel that we are in that wave that it's, it takes, I spend more time trying to distinguish good from bad than the benefits I'm getting right now, right? Because everybody's announcing AI something, something, right? Whatever you're using, whatever you're doing in your professional life, there are 57 vendors that are selling you the life-changing AI for that something, right? And to me, that's the frustrating part. We are still not over that hump. And that happened in the past, that happened with Agile, with DevOps, that happened with CICD, with everything, right? But uh. so, if, if if I'm hearing you say uh, that transition transitional phase, please go through it. Like, don't bother me until you kind of settled. You know, that that's a fair thing. I don't, you don't want to pay the innovation tech. You maybe don't need it to be competitive. That's all good. But if you need it to be competitive, because all your other competitors are doing it. <laughs> What choice do you have, right? So, no, no, I'm I'm saying the opposite. I I want to be in it. I, I don't want to wait until it settles. It's just a bit frustrating if you if you want to be an early adopter of something, and that that's always equally valid in the past as it is now, right? Well, you know, for me that makes it. I try from getting chaos to structure. <laughs> So I, I don't mind too much because I, I, it's always when you do the new things that you, you, you know you go through that phase. But there's definitely a lot of overhead, so I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there. But it, it also brings the opportunity. Sometimes it's, it's the example of, you say, if somebody has to write a Hello World these days, they don't need to know Assembler, they don't need to know all that stuff. So they've skipped the intermediate layers. But again, when it doesn't work, what can they do? They can reboot the computer. So for me, this is also part of the learning process that I'll be able to help better if I, even though there is an overhead to understand the transitional phase, like, oh yeah, because we did this, because of that, because of that, that we had a problem. And that has helped me many times in adopting something new and then dealing with it when it fails. Uh, Let's go back to your learning process to where you're at now in February of 2024. When did you start going down this awful path? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's let's say on um, there were a lot of things leading up to this. The thing that probably let me most is that I was bored of DevOps. <laughs> the second thing was that I was looking for new and interesting things to do. I I went from going through the metaverse. And then game engines, like, you know, I mentioned on the podcast, virtual humans, because during COVID, I wanted to clone myself and I didn't like to do presentations on stuff, but I was still 
very elaborate because I had to scan myself. I had to do all kind of, you know, programming to get this working. And then more and more what took over is that like, yeah, to make myself as a human, I, I just use an AI model to model my face and I don't have to do all the pixels. And, and then last year, end of last year, no, one year ago, uh, there, there was the whole stable diffusion video took off and then text, right? So that's how I leapt into this. And the text part was definitely powerful in the, the kind of problems we were yeah, able to solve or the use case that it opened up to or the, the, the reduction of cost that we were able to do that. So that's how I rolled into this. But funny enough, maybe like 25 years ago or even 30 years ago, I did like text analysis through natural language processing and did that stuff. I worked together with uh, the video archiving to detect scene changes in videos and face recognition. But I, I, I didn't know any of the technology because I was no, I did not have enough math and I did not have, have enough science rigor. But now I feel that we're up to the phase that it's like, integration <laughs> and that's what i've done my whole life and i'm pretty good at it i think and and that's what makes me thrive again uh in that world there do you remember the first time you came upon the jupiter notebook process i mean how you decided to stick down that path well the, the Jupyter notebook is something that came from the ml ops world more there i had a hunch that i wanted to go in machine learning but it, Again, like I said, AI ops, machine learning, ML ops, it was all about those mathematical models and training and, and doing a whole lot of stuff. And it didn't feel like me. But again, that just came natural because most of the new AI coding languages is predominantly came from Python. And then Python has this link with people trying that stuff in Juniper notebooks uh, in the machine learning. So that came from that world. So for me, the first time that was, you know, in anger was probably somewhere, um, yeah, maybe two months before I, I gave that presentation or something that I said, like, oh, I, I just want to learn. It seems like a good thing to learn uh, in this world. I, I, for example, I have never coded Python. <laughs> so that was another thing I, I, I skipped somehow in my career. And then I said, like, okay, let's me, let me finally learn Python. <laughs> So let me ask this question because we haven't asked it yet. And you just sort of went down that path. Give us your definition of ML versus AI. Um, I think the difference, well, I would say it's probably the difference between machine learning and the gen AI, right? I'm, I'm not talking about the whole AI thing. It's, it's like the LLMs and generative AI, stable diffusion and those kind of models. I think the difference is that before you need to have a data scientist and a lot of training to get that model working. And yes, you could download stuff, but it, it was more for specific cases that you were training. It, it, it's like, it felt a lot more to statistical things. And now with Gen AI, it feels like it's in the word. It generates stuff without me having to train or code or do something weird with this. For me, that that, yeah, it's it's a really big definition. I agree, <laughs> but I, I'm pretty known for shitty definitions. So. I understand that when we use Gen AI models like GPT or whatever somebody is using, right? Uh, a lot of time and effort was put into creating those models. But once they're created, are they updating themselves with user prompts? or they're some kind of a static thing. So whenever I go to BARD, let's say, or uh, ChatGPT and type something, does that enhance the, the model at the same time? No, not automatically. So the model is typically, uh, you think of it as a binary that you get. It's like a full binary. But if they want to incorporate all the things that people have been chatting or learning, then they'll have to retrain either the complete model or as I mentioned, they take this and they patch the existing model with slices. And then it becomes, that patch becomes like another binary file that you load on top of the other one. 
But if you p just prompt the prompt and you typing something, it is just in the input output buffer. It's not changing the model in any automatic way. That sounds like almost lost opportunity. <laughs> Let me give you another example. I have the generic LLM and I want to make it specific to my business. That could be one fine tuning, but then I want to make it specific to all my customers. So do I build that patch for all my customers? And then do I rebuild this every week, every month, every day, that patch layer, or I stick to putting the knowledge things in the prompt. So that's, that's, that's something that people are trying to figure out like, do I have to put things in the model in the patch or I do this in kind of a real time, adding it in the prompt. What we've learned so far is that even when we train the model, the model might, if we train it to our own, it might hallucinate more <laughs> because you're shifting the weights a little bit from the existing ones. So, what seems to be the most common thing that I've seen at least uh, is that you patch the model that gives you better, what they call structure in the answers and it knows a little bit better on what you're expecting, but you're still feeding this in real time with the information that you've found. Another reason why you can't put everything in the model because there's certain content that is restricted and you cannot restrict uh, <laughs> data in the model, it's being trained or it's not being trained. You, you can't just say, well, you know, it's trained for that. It just, when that person calls, there's, <laughs> that's going to be the, the answer. So that's another reason of not putting everything in the model, but more of the global knowledge and then kind of restricted knowledge you keep outside of their information. Although there's now ways of triggering with keywords, you kind of say the magic word <laughs> to an LLM, it activates the right layer <laughs> that you have access to. So those are other ways that people have been trying to do. And then that brings up the, the other problem. If I'm serving a model, let's say I, I have a GPU and, and I need it, but if I need to have a GPU per customer per model, <laughs> imagine that that's going to explode. So what we're trying to do right now is to have almost like an auto swap in of the patch layer, depending on the call, because that has a more efficient memory and allows me to serve multiple customers from the same hardware at the same time. So it's all evolving. I'm, I'm, I'm not making it up, I, I swear, <laughs> but uh, it's, yeah, it's where we're going. So I want to stay there for just a second longer. So patching the model feels like we're just patching real code. Whereas if we're augmenting the data in a prompt, that feels like having a REPL that we could use for any language. Yeah, and by the way, nobody says patching the model. I'm, I'm just using it because it's something we understand as you know, you have the binary and then you patch that and it's like a shift and it's a smaller file. And you say people are trying to be able to swap out those patches, if you will, Yeah, yeah. In today, but yeah, that can't be done today. No, no. They're, 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 I haven't seen, an, let's say, an enterprise solution able to do this, but, or at least that it's visible. It might be that actually OpenAI is doing this when you are able to say, so in, in OpenAI, you can feed it with your own documentation or your documents. You can just upload them and they have a fine tuning service and, you know, it's instantly. So I can only imagine they are doing this under the hood. And then I've seen some let's say open source solutions, kind of proxy-like types who are working on this to kind of do this swap in, swap out or layering thing. And the other thing that much like we had an API router, to, you know, a gateway or something, people are doing this well. If you do this call, oh, this seems like a good one for that model. So you you're kind of have this multi LLM router who kind of makes decision based on this is my input prompt. This is maybe the cost that I want to give it, quality of service that I want to return. So that's another, like, I call this like the LLM fabric or the LLM infrastructure that we're seeing emerge of in between. And it's just not serving the model. There's a lot of things happening and pieces that are emerging in that field. But now you're both looking at me like, what? <laughs> no, 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 it makes perfect sense. 
I was thinking of uh, something else. I was thinking how, at least when looking at software engineering, most of the history of our profession was focused on how can we be more and more specific, right? Uh, we switched from clicking buttons in a web UI to infrastructure as code, at least from my perspective, first and foremost, so that we can be specific, right? I don't know what you clicked over there, but if you run this Terraform, I know what we're going to get, right? And now it's almost as if we're reversing kind of like, okay, forget about being specific. Just say that you would like to run this. Yeah, it is indeed, it feels less controlled. And one of the areas where that manifests itself is, how do we test this stuff? <laughs> because if I change the prompt, the logic of my application will completely change. If I use another model for this because there's a new version, it might completely change. This uncertainty of being able to test this, and I cannot imagine all the input people are typing. I cannot put that in test cases. It's, it's like close to impossible. So more and more you will see that testing of this stuff, not only in the CI CD pipeline becomes important, but also capturing the the live data and the feedback from the end customer, what is happening in real time. So, Exactly. I mean, testing or predictability. I, I can easily see, and I'm doing that myself, right? I use Copilot and Bard a lot, and I use it a lot to, hey, uh, I'm too lazy now, right? Give me Terraform something, something that will uh, generate a cluster in AWS, right? And I have that file, and it's great. It helped me. I need to modify maybe a few things and go. I understand that. I'm fully on board with that. But then if the next step is, hey, create a cluster for me, right, in AWS, then, yeah, I mean, let's say that I'm even happy with the result, but then it will be upgraded the cluster and it will end up being running in Google, right? There is no that predictability in a way. I mean, I'm pretty sure that we're going to get there eventually, but now it sounds scary. I cannot let it do anything. I can let it generate stuff that, I will use, but not do anything. Mm -hmm. So I would draw the parallel between Chaos Monkey was scary until we made it a safe environment to do so. So this kind of unpredictability can be mitigated, obviously, by making sure there's certain safeguards in place. And you see now people shifting from, hey, we're happy that it works most of the time to let's figure now the other 80% of our time on when it doesn't work, that we can do it safely. And that's kind of a, another mitigation, like run this in the sandbox, maybe ask it first on a simulation, or I, I don't know what's going to happen, but you, you'll have to compensate some of that uncertainty by creating a safe environment where it can go wrong or it's allowed to go wrong. But we all know that it can be scary on the costs and certain things, but it's, it's going to be a mixture. Like whatever degree of freedom we're, we're giving it here has to kind of be compensated a little bit on the other layer to be on the safe side uh, there as well. I just realized that my battery is gone on the <laughs> camera and that Darin is gone as well. I have no idea what happened there. So I'm... I'm Officially, I'm taking over the podcast. Uh, so thank you for 250 episodes. <laughs> From now on, AI is taking over and we're good. So, We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there that helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox.